Good morning. Checking in with everybody. How are we all today? Everybody good? Did you all have a good week? Awesome. So there was a question, and I want to clarify our rhythm. So last week, we studied abundance. And then on your handout, you had opportunity to read scripture about abundance, to just kind of, what did you say, Anne? To emphasize that, yes. to, to soak in it. And so those were the scriptures, and that was on page three of your handout. Today, we're getting ready for the promise, excuse me, the promise, promise of grace. And so that begins a new section, and you'll have additional scripture reading for the week to come. So on our handouts, while it says week two, I know we're really into week three. So whoever did the handout, you know, you just can't trust people, right? <laughs> so I did not mean for that to be confusing. We had an introduction, and then we started with lesson one. Maybe that would have been better, lesson two. So, so during this week, we'll again read scripture that begins on page five. So that will become your homework or additional opportunities, and I'll try to also clarify that in our class email. And you're in a, for a treat today because you get to do some other things with regard to prayer for the week to come, and you'll learn about that as we get going. Well, welcome to the study of Tracing Grace. So glad that you're here today. Glad that we have opportunity to learn together. Let's uh, get started today. I'll invite you to have your handout handy on page four is where we're at. I'd also invite you to grab a Bible. I gave you a little warning. Everybody do a few little exercises here because we're going to flip through some pages today in the Bible. So get your, get your hands warmed up. Or if you are using a Bible app, awesome. So there's a YouVersion Bible app on your phone that you can use, and some of us do that. And so I want to let you know no one is going to be judging you if you're looking at your phone because you're probably most likely looking up Scripture, and that's awesome. So if you need more information on the Bible apps, let us know, and we can provide that in our class email as well. All right, today, the promise of grace. Let's see if we can pull up our scripture. We're going to take a look. This is on your handout. You don't necessarily have to turn to it in your Bible. But the promise of grace is given to us in 2 Corinthians verse 13, 13. If you have your handout handy, <laughs> I like saying that, handout handy, let's read it together. How does that sound? Ready? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Isn't that a beautiful scripture and a beautiful promise to each one of us? God gives us promises. Okay, so I'm going to share with you instead of being able to see it. We've got some slides coming back up. So here are these promises of God. God promises us daily I am your strength. I will never leave you. I have plans for you to prosper. I hear your prayers. I will fight for you. I will give you peace. I always love you. Those are promises from God. Jesus also gives us promises, and I have some of those as well. When you're tired, I will give you rest. When you think it's impossible, he promises this, everything is possible for the one who believes. When you're ready to give up, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So keep standing. When you face doubt, take heart, I've overcome the world. When your faith is low, ask in prayer. When you need a calling, 
You are the light of the world. Turn to somebody and tell her that. My Zoom friends, you can say it out loud as well. You are the light. We have these beautiful promises. Oh, sorry, one more. When you lose focus, seek first God's kingdom. All right. The promise of grace is the same thing as the promise of God. And according to our key verse, if you look at it again, you'll see that there are three persons mentioned. We're going to take a look at what that means, It's the Trinity. So today, we're going to try our best to understand the Trinity. I don't know about you all, but the Trinity is another one of those words that is a great big concept, and it takes my brain a lot to try to comprehend, because God is just so good and so big and so wonderful. It's hard for me sometimes to comprehend. And so I found an image that I thought might be helpful. So in this image, you'll see that God is in the center there. And the three persons of the Trinity is also depicted here. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God is these things. But they're also distinguishable from one another. So the Father is not the Son. They are two persons, distinguishable. Well, we're going to go through what that means. The, the Father is different than the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is different or is not the Son. And yet, they are three in one. When we hear about the Trinity, it does not mean that we have three gods. There is what's in the very middle of that. There is one God. And so we have to keep that in mind. But the more that we get to know the three members of the Trinity, I think the more rich our faith is. So let's take a look at what the Trinity might mean for us. And we're going to go through these one at a time, and we're going to look up some scripture that goes along with each of these. So when we think about God is only one God, even though there are three members of the Trinity, only one God. Well, why do we say that? Scripture tells us. So if you will, take a look in your Bible at the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is toward the beginning. It's included in those first five books of the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. This is a familiar verse, perhaps. I'm going to read it from the Common English Bible so it might sound a little bit different than what you're used to hearing, but I think you'll re, uh, just remember this phrase from hearing it previously. Israel, listen. Our God is the Lord, only the Lord. So right here at the beginning of the Bible, we're instructed that there is only one God. This is the prayer that our Jewish friends state regularly. Let's turn now to the New Testament, Galatians. Galatians is deep, deep, deep into the New Testament. If you want to see, it kind of looks like this. <laughs> Head to the back, toward the back of your Bible, Galatians. Galatians 3.20. It's a good sound I'm hearing, those pages turning, I love that. Verse 20 says, now the mediator does not take one side, but God is one. And here the mediator is talking about the Holy Spirit, another member of the Trinity. But it again states, God is one. So one of the first things we need to learn when we're considering the Trinity is there is only one God. And scripture backs that up and tells us so. Let's take a look at how our one God is three persons. Three persons. All right, we're heading back to the beginning. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. That's easy to find in my Bible anyway. I can head to the beginning pretty quickly. I'm checking in with Zoom. Is everybody good? Lisa, can you hear? 
Everybody's fine? Okay, awesome. Thank you. We got to be sure both our roomies and our zoomies are doing okay. All right, Genesis 1-1. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, okay, I'm going to stop right there, just that little snippet. I'm going to give you an inside, some inside information, at least for me. I have to dig a little bit. The word God in this, in Hebrew, is Elohim. E-L-O-H-I-M. Elohim. That's the word in Hebrew, and it's plural. It's a plural word. So when it says, when God began to create, it's really a plural reference. One God, three persons. I know, see, my head is already, right? But hang with it, hang with it here. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. This is the story of the baptism of Jesus, and it clearly tells us that there's one God in three persons. Verse 16, when Jesus was baptized, he immediately came up out of the water. Heaven was opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove and resting on him. What a beautiful picture of God as three in one. All right, now let's take a look how they are distinguishable from one another. The members of the Trinity, they are one God, three persons, and we can distinguish between. And here we find reference to this in the book of Psalms. So Psalm 2, verse 7. I will announce the Lord's decision. He said to me, you are my son. Today, I have become your father. So the Lord has a son. All right, let's take a look at Psalm 51, verse 10 through 12. Anybody else underline things in your Bible? This is one I always underline. This is such a good, good passage right here. Create a clean heart for me, God. Put a new faithful spirit deep inside me. Please don't throw me out of your presence. Please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Return the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me with a willing spirit. The spirit is distinguished from God in this passage. Let's take a look at John, the Gospel of John. John chapter 14. Verses 16 and 17. I will ask the Father, and he will send another companion who will be with you forever. This companion is the spirit of truth, whom the world can't receive because it neither sees him nor recognizes him. But you know him because he lives with you and will be with you. Jesus speaks to the Father, asking the Father to send the helper, the Holy Spirit. They are distinguishable from one another. Let's learn a little bit more about how each is God. Each member of the Trinity is God, and we see this here in the Gospel of John. Jump to chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 27. This is the passage teaching about the bread of life. It says in verse 27, don't work for the food that doesn't last, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the human one will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So 
So here we learn the Father is God. Let's take a look at Colossians. Colossians. It's deep in the New Testament. It's after the Gospels. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. My CEV says it like this, all the fullness of deity lives in Christ's body. So the Son is God. We're learning here how each member of the Trinity is God. And then finally, let's see what it says about the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter three, verse 16. This is also a sweet promise to each one of us. It says, don't you know that you, you, me, we are God's temple and God's spirit lives in you. So the Holy Spirit is God. So far, we've learned the Trinity. There is only one God, but there are three persons. They are distinguishable from one another. Each is God. Finally, each has a different task. Or we see this in Scripture, that different tasks are described in the members of the Trinity. You all are still doing okay? Are we doing all right? Fingers all right? Okay, get ready. We're going, we've started at Genesis 1-1, right? Now we're going all the way to Revelation. Let's take a look at the book of Revelation. The last book of our Bible. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power because you created all things. It is by your will that they existed and were created. Here we learn that the Father is the source or cause of the universe. That's the task described in this passage of God the Father. Let's head back to the Gospel of John. John 3, 16. You'll be familiar with this verse and 17. You can probably read it with me or say it with me. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. Verse 17 goes on to say this, God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. What's the task here of Jesus the son? Salvation. Salvation. That is what Jesus does in this passage. All right, let's stick here with um, the Gospel of John. Take a look at chapter 14. In John 14, 10, don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I've spoken to you, I don't speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me does his works. Here we learn that Jesus, his works are part of what he does. Jesus' human works is a task that's described in that passage. Okay, do I have any more on that one? Let's take a look. A few more, can we still go through a few more? Let's take a look at Colossians. The book of Colossians, remember again, it's deep in the New Testament. 
Colossians chapter 1. Verse 16 and 17. Because all things were created by him, both in heavens and on the earth, the things that are visible and the things that are invisible, whether they are thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He existed before all things, and all things are held together in him. This is describing the Son, Jesus the Son. And all things were created and are held together in him. That's part of what Jesus does. He holds it all together. I have in my notes here, it says, the son is the agent through whom the father does his work. The creation and the maintenance of the universe. And I think that's what's described here. Revelations 1.1. A revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what's, what must soon take place. Christ made it known by sending it through his angel to his servant John. Again, this is a task that Jesus the Son does. He completes the work. He fulfills the work of God the Father. And then 2 Corinthians 5.19 Getting good at finding where everything is? Who has tabs? Some of us have tabs. Yeah, you're doing it quickly then. Who wants tabs now? (laughs) All right, 2 Corinthians 5.19. In other words, God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ. By not counting people's sins against them, he has trusted us with this message of reconciliation. What do you think the task here is for Jesus? Starts with an R. Reconciliation. Okay, I think we have just a few more, and then we'll be done. We're learning again that each member of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, has different tasks, as described in Scripture. That's what we're learning. Psalm 104.30. Psalm 104, verse 30. When you let loose your breath, they are created, and you make the surface of the ground brand new again. What do you think breath means in this verse? Holy Spirit. And so here, the Holy Spirit is the means by whom the Father works through, through the breath of the Holy Spirit. That was part of the creation. Second Peter, chapter 1. Ooh, Second Peter is a tough one. Tries to hide away. It's just before the book of Revelation. First and second Peter, there's only a few pages devoted to this book in our Bible. Second Peter, and then we'll we'll, uh, back up and look at first Peter. So second Peter, chapter one, verse 21. Because no prophecy ever came by human will. Instead, men and women led by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Divine revelation comes through the Holy Spirit. That is a task of the Holy Spirit to reveal God's character, God's purpose, God's plan to us. That's a task of the Holy Spirit, this divine revelation. Back it up to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. God the Father chose you because of what he knew beforehand. He chose you through the Holy Spirit's work of making you holy, and because of the faithful obedience and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, may God's grace and peace be multiplied to you. What is the task here of the Holy Spirit? To make us holy. 
There is one God, three persons of that God. Each one is distinguishable, each one is God, and each one has a different task. The Bible gives us this promise. What does that mean for our life today? We're going to talk about this thing called promise and how it seems to be easy to either keep or break a promise. All right. So what is a promise? Here's just a great definition I found. A promise establishes the expectation that a particular thing will happen, and when the commitment is fulfilled, it builds confidence that the individual can be trusted to keep their word. So chances are, each one of us, we have people in our lives that we trust. We know that when they say they're going to do something, they're going to do it. We can believe in them. They've never failed on us. Yes, everybody have a few people like that? Let's hope so. But we may also know maybe at least one person who might forget their promise. We'll be kind, right? And that can be frustrating. But I want us to consider the ways that we actually make and then break promises to ourselves. And why, do we, why we do that. Have you ever said anything like this? I'm going to start taking better care of myself, I promise. I'm going to start eating healthier, I promise. I'm going to exercise five days a week, I promise. <laughs> oh, thanks for laughing. <laughs> yeah, same. I'm going to set aside quality time for me, I promise. I'm going to start saying no more often. We make promises to ourselves. Now, those that I've listed, some of those are based on, you know, desire to change or a little bit of emotion. So sometimes you might consider those to be intentions rather than promises. And when we say things like that, we feel it in the moment, don't we? But then sometimes those feelings kind of fade. And we ease back into our normal rhythm, our normal um, way of either eating, exercising, or not, <laughs> and believing in ourselves. But we don't need to, uh, we shouldn't allow these breaches of trust to continue because that eats away at our self esteem and our self confidence. Every time we make a promise to ourselves and then break it, it kind of knocks us down a notch or two. And so I want us to consider ways that we might value this commitment that we make to ourselves. So let's see, I found some helpful ways to keep our promises. So first, if you really, really, really want to keep a promise to yourself, consider how to become self-aware. Think about it. Before you make a statement or a promise, is it really something that you can commit to that's going to be important, that you can work toward, that you can set as a very strong goal? Become aware of your time, your other commitments, and then tell yourself, if you're making a statement like that, intention or not, that it is a promise. It's a promise and then just keep that elevated as a promise. Secondly, be real. Is this really something you wanna do? Can you do? Is it something that's practical that will actually work in your life? Sometimes we have grand goals, and those are fine, but if you're making a promise to yourself, let's be sure that it's something you can actually do. Let's be real. And then create a plan of action. If you're serious about fulfilling the promise you've made, then it's worth taking the time to determine the actual steps to accomplish it. Keeping a promise to yourself, and I think we put this on the handout even because I think it's just so true and so important. Nothing will guarantee a boost to our self-esteem and confidence like making a promise and keeping it, especially when it's a promise to yourself. 
The power of promise. It really matters. We're going to learn from a biblical character what a promise looked like and the power and the, the um, results that came from believing in this promise. Show you what she looks like. You all guessed her so well before. Who do we have here? Rahab. Her story is told in the book of Joshua. It's an Old Testament book. And I'll just kind of give you a synopsis. You feel free to turn to Joshua chapter 2. And then her story starts there, continues in chapter 6, and continues throughout the end of that particular chapter in those later verses. But here's her story. Joshua sent spies to Jericho, and they lodged at the house of Rahab. She's described in a couple of different ways, one of which is a prostitute. Another way is an innkeeper. But this is where her story gets really interesting, I think. The spies show up. And her quick thinking gave them time and opportunity to get back to their camp. In return, doing a favor for them, she asked that they would spare her family from death. The spies guaranteed safety as long as her family remained in her home during the attack that would ensue. And what was the sign she was to display? The red cord, outer window. When the city of Jericho was being taken then, Rahab and her family were rescued and led out to a place outside of camp. Rahab later becomes the wife of Simone, the great-great-grandmother of King David and an ancestor of Jesus Christ. She was a woman of faith, courage, and love. And scripture backs this up because she's not only mentioned here in the book of Joshua, but elsewhere in our Bible. Okay, I want to share just a little bit more about Rahab. This is from some commentary. She has a special function in the narratives of Israel's existence in the land. Remember, Israel was trying to take the land. This was part of God's plan. So to these spies, she explains that she knows God will give Israel the land. If you do take a look at Joshua, Joshua chapter 2, verse 8, it says quite clearly, Rahab knows about God, who God is and what he has done. She's heard about the events that have occurred up to this point, the way that Israel, the people, have been able to conquer land and peoples. She goes on to say in this passage that terror has fallen on the inhabitants, and they all fear Israel. Rahab was an outsider to God's people, and yet she'd heard about what God had done, and she believed in the power, the presence, and the promise of this God, that God would do and his people would do what he said they were going to do. So this is the message the spies bring back. Rahab, according to this commentary, turns into a prophet or is described as a prophet, foretelling Israel's occup occupation of that land, of the city of Jericho. Also, Rahab, she's triply marginalized. So once again, we see God working through someone who's quite unlikely. She's triply marginalized. What a phrase. She's a Canaanite, she's a woman. And she's a prostitute. But she, being that person, moves into the center of God's divine promise and allows Israel or enables, is part of the story of Israel taking the land that God said Israel would have. So she's remembered in Jewish tradition as somebody to respect as an ancestress of kings and prophets. And then, as I mentioned, as, as she is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. A little bit more commentary, because I just think it's so fascinating. She's listed in the genealogy in Matthew. If you want to look at 
the Gospel of Matthew, the first chapter. That's the genealogy listed there in, in Matthew. And in this gene- genealogy, there are five women mentioned. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. Each of these women have pretty um, unlikely circumstance. It's unlikely for them to have been used in God's purpose due to their circumstance. If you want to, you can look them up. Their stories are amazing. But the the very fact that Rahab is included in this list, it indicates that divine plan, the promise of God can move in ways that contravene traditional family values. I know you know something about Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was unwed, declared to be pregnant. These are not traditional family values, even for today, but certainly for ancient people. And there's a phrase in this particular commentary that I really like. It describes each of these women, but particularly Rahab, as using higher righteousness, a higher righteousness. Because you see, Rahab was not necessarily honest, was she? She hid the spies when the authorities came to check with her, where are they? She lied and said that they had already left and even pointed, they went that way. And the Canaanite, the authorities, went that way to look for them. This is described in commentary as a higher righteousness. She recognizes the promise of God, the promise of God's people, and so she acts on that behalf. She chooses an Israelite affiliation and claims the God of Israel as her own. This is all included in this idea of higher righteousness. Rahab is somebody we can look up to, and I think it's described here, according to commentary, she's really a heroine for all of us who need a greater measure of faith, a strong dose of courage, and a larger capacity to love others. And she did what she did because she believed in the promise of God. I think that's a good takeaway for us today. Shirley, would you like to help us move into a time of prayer? My stuff out of your way. Good morning, ladies. First of all, I would like to um, call your attention to the prayer requests on the table. Uh, These are the ones from last week, and I want to share this scripture with you from James 5, 13 to 16. We are told to pray for ourselves and for others. The prayer of righteous people is powerful and effective. I believe that with my whole heart. I think that prayer can change things. Um, I just want to add a note that I told you last week, I looked over these and I prayed over these. If you would like to include your email address, I will respond to you with a short note. I will not share your email address with anyone, uh, but please write it very clearly so I can get the email address correct when I send uh, you a note, and I'll be very happy to do that. Okay. Today we're going to talk about prayer and consecration of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was approaching Jerusalem on his last journey there, which would end with his crucifixion on the cross, he had began to comfort his disciples for his departure, promising them to send an advocate or a counselor to them. The disciples really did not understand that at all. They could not imagine that Jesus would go and die. I don't know if you remember the story of Peter saying, Oh, Lord, this must not happen to you. And he was willing to fight and die for Jesus. 
Jesus rebuked him for that because that was Jesus' fulfillment of his task. As we learned this morning, there were tasks for the Trinity. In Acts 2, we see that Jesus' promise was fulfilled because as the disciples were praying in the upper room, a a wind came through the room and tongues of fire appeared above their heads and they were able to speak in languages that the God-fearing Jews could understand. These were people who had come from many parts of the world in celebration of the Pentecost festival. And so they were able to speak in tongues so that everyone could understand. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. From this astounding event, the church was born. The disciples began to teach and preach, knowing that Jesus' promise of the Holy Spirit had been fulfilled. The following prayers that we're going to do today are parts of the earliest novenas, uh, which are repetitious prayers over several days. This novena is addressed to the Holy Spirit and is a plea for virtues that we need to live the Christian life. I'm hoping that if you pray these short little prayers throughout the day, that they will become a mantra for you as you encounter challenges in your daily living. And at the end, you will find prayer prompts. Uh, We'll talk about that in just a moment. If If you turn to page four in your handout, down at the bottom is the prayer we're going to pray today. And then on the succeeding pages, five and six, our prompts for prayers throughout the next five days. So turn to a blank page in your journal. And today we're going to take a few little notes as we go through this first prayer so you'll have a guideline to go with you over the next few days. But first of all, I want to share with you John 15:5. Jesus is teaching the disciples, I am the vine, you are the branches. We can never serve God completely without the grace of the Holy Spirit, for we are connected to that vine. So, I want to, first of all, pray as a group the prayer. So, in your journal, make the first notation of pray. The second part will be meditate. The third part will be pray again. The fourth part will be contemplate. And then pray one more time. Okay, let's go back and use this prayer. Do you see the prayer? Holy Spirit, grant me the spirit of grace. Do you find that at the bottom of your page four? Okay. Together, read that with me. Holy Spirit, grant me the spirit of grace that I may treat other people with loving kindness and caring concern, modeling Christ's love on the cross. Take a couple of moments and meditate on the meaning of that. Read that silently to yourself and meditate on it. Let's pray that prayer together once again. Holy Spirit, grant me the spirit of grace 
that I may treat other people with loving kindness and caring concern, modeling Christ's love on the cross. In your journal, take a moment to write down this thought. How can I model this prayer for others around me? In what ways might I model this prayer? All right, let's come together and pray this one more time. Holy Spirit, grant me the spirit of grace that I may treat other people with loving kindness and caring concern, modeling Christ's love on the cross. You have a bookmark in your grace box that will give you the words for each day of the coming week. You have that you can refer to. Also, on pages five and six of your handout, you have the prayers uh, listed day one, day two, day three, so forth. On the next day, we're going to pray for the spirit of wisdom. And you have a scripture that you can read that will help enlighten that. Day two, we're going to pray for the spirit of understanding. I've given you an acronym that you can associate with grace. When you're trying to remember what grace means in your life, the acronym is God's riches at Christ's expense. But Next day is the spirit of counsel, and we read about uh, Jesus again telling the disciples that a counselor or an advocate will be sent to them. On day four, we read about the spirit of fortitude. There's a passage in Philippians that uh, uh, Paul tells about all of his trials that he's gone through during his ministry. It shows fortitude. And day five is the spirit of knowledge in which Paul is advising his protege, Timothy, that the scriptures are inspired by God. So you might want to read those Bible passages in tandem as you're praying those prayers. My hope is that throughout the day, beginning with today, that you will remember that we are praying for our ability to treat one another with loving care and, and kindness throughout the day. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'm going to be bringing you um, our um, introduction for this week for scripture under the promises of grace. And in your um, workbook, I talk about, we talk about how God wants us to be completely assured that we know he promises to give us grace every day and in every situation. It's wonderful that our belief in the Holy Trinity brings us God in three persons to provide us with all we need in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We can see and know the promises of God's grace for us throughout the Bible. And this redundancy is not accidental, but is intentionally repetitive. So that we're sure of his forgiveness, his compassion, his presence, and always his unending love. The Bible reveals countless promises of grace in the form of blessings, mercy, forgiveness, healing, comfort, peace, joy, and so much more. 
Think about the idea of when a promise is made and how important it is to be able to trust the person who makes the promise and what it feels like to hope for the promise to be fulfilled. I know we've all been in this situation. We have all experienced making promises and having promises made to us. To us. Most, most of us have experienced breaking a promise we made, even if it was unintentional. And most of us have felt what it is like to have someone break a promise to us. There's excitement in giving or receiving a promise, even when it is something small. In contrast, there is sadness, let down, maybe even anger or bitterness when a promise is broken. The good news about God's promises is that every promise is offered to all of us all of the time in a limited, way, limitless way for us to have all of our days. There are so many promises of God's grace. He promises to love us, to be with us always, to send the Holy Spirit to comfort us. Being faithful to God means we are promised everlasting life in heaven. He will always forgive us. He has redeemed us and he is coming back to us. He has placed your name in the book of life and you will always be his loving child. And he knows your name and every hair upon your head. Pay close attention to the good things around you this week. Can you see ways which God's promise of grace touches your life in both good moments and in the harder times? Try to use the Lectio Divina method to read each daily verse four times. Read for content, meditate on the meaning, pray for understanding and discernment of what that meaning could be for you, and then contemplate how you can apply the scripture as an action or a behavior change in your own, own life each day. I've listed for you scripture from today, which is our uh, memory verse or our um, main verse from 2 Corinthians 13, 11, 14 through next Wednesday for scripture. And I hope that you will read them each day. God bless you. All right. Anne, you're up. So graceful, isn't she lovely? She doesn't drop anything, it's just wonderful. Sure. I'll also clean up on my mess. Okay. <laughs> Before I started, I just wanted to make a, a, just a note about what uh, Shirley said. Sometimes I pick up the bag for food, and I don't, I pick up the bag, that's the action. I don't have to actually feel it right then. But the act to, to pray, to meditate about the bag of food, to take action to fill the bag of food, and then to contemplate it afterwards. And I think sometimes I miss that contemplation point. And I think that whole process makes us grow spiritually. So thank you, Shirley. Appreciated that. Okay, we have a lot to cover, and I was supposed to start three minutes ago, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, today, we are going to make a cloud column and a fire column, the one that Rahab saw when she looked out over at the Israelite camp. That's one of the things we're doing. Um, but to backtrack just a little bit, uh, a couple weeks ago, I met with Kimberly Morrow, um, who you may know is blind from birth, and I asked her if she would like to 
explore clay because you can see with your hands. And of course, she's an avid knitter and is very intuitive and does a thousand things. Um, also uh, translates Braille and is at the Library of Congress. I mean, there's a long list. Anyway, she's on Zoom and I hopefully today, um, we made a cloud and, and fire together and, um, and she made several pieces in plastic clay that you bake in the oven and she did very well. Uh, you'll see the cloud and the fire up on the screen, okay? Um, in fact, I made some clouds and fire for her and gave her a formula for it, but her clouds look better than mine. Um, and I have both of those samples in the back there. You can see them uh, together. In fact, um, that's when she said to me that clouds reminded her of the song Both Sides Now by Joni Mitchell, if you recall. I'm not going to sing it. Um, it occurred to me that as I listened to the words that this could be Rahab's song. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, we learned a little bit about Rahab, or actually pretty much. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about her. Um, of course, she was a young and beautiful girl given to the king, and then when he no longer wanted her, she became a prostitute to support her family. She lived in the wall at Jericho, and we all know what happened to that. It came tumbling down. She saw the power and provision of the, of the God of the Israelites, and, she, and as she witnessed the cloud column in the daytime and the fire column at night, she wanted that God for herself. She must have been disillusioned with her life. Did she look at love from both sides now, from up and down, and still somehow? It's love's illusions, I recall. I really don't know love at all. There's my allergy song. Okay. <laughs> or did she look at life from both sides now, from win and lose, when she was beautiful and the king really loved her? and loose. And still somehow, it's life's illusions I recall. I really don't know life at all. And there before her, and everyone else for that matter, was a powerful, faithful, providing God. Okay, a little bit more about Rahab later, but right now I want to get started on today's project. Um, if you would take your paper, which is the white paper in front of you, I did want you to know that imagination is God's marker in you. And that's from Mako Fujimura. God's marker in you is imagination. And Rahab certainly had one. She imagined a God she'd never heard of. Now, you're going to hot dog fold it. That means fold it long ways as opposed to hamburger bun. It's hot dog. Okay, so you hot dog fold it long ways. So you have two column shapes on either side. Now, like I did for Kimberly, I just gave her um, two ways of working with clay. One is a little ball and one's a coil. So I'm going to give you a little circular motif and then and a little ellipse that's pinched, and so you have cloud and fire. So as you do this, I want you to build it in a stack so that one side is a cloud and the other side is fire. Is that clear? This is what we're doing, okay? So these are the things that Rahab saw in the Israelite camp. And as you work, um, I am going to... Um, read something from the, um, the book, The Lineage of Grace, and then we're going to work on this Celtic knot. So let's get started on this. You might not be able to finish, but I'm going to read a little about, bit about Rahab as you work from The Lineage of Grace. Of course, this, this is through Francine Rivers' imagination, and so work, 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 because you have another project to do. Okay. <laughs> Um, she is speaking here into an imagined brother called Mizraim. And um, he says, 
They'll never take Jericho, Mizraim says, picking up his cup of wine. I've been working on fortifications since the last full moon. You know yourself how tall and wide those walls are. No army can break through them. You boast, but I see fear in your eyes. She was not cowed by his angry glare. What are these walls to a God who can part the seas? We've heard all the stories. God laid waste to Egypt with ten plagues. He spoke through Moses, and a nation was delivered from slavery. He opened the Red Sea so the Israelites crossed over to dry land. Have you ever heard of such a power? Truly, he is God, the only God. You must know this. I've always told you everything I've heard. Think on what you know. Why else do you think our people quake in terror, you among them? But this is our land, Joab said. They have no right to it. We build these walls. We planted the crops and build the houses. Our father's father and his father before him harvested dates from the palm grove just beyond these walls. She wanted to shake them all. We've bound down to these bales all these years, thinking they were all the owners of the land. But this land belongs to the God out there, and he's going to take it. She gave a bleak laugh. Do you think we'll we'll be safe because you've sacrificed two statues we carved and molded? What power have they over the elements, she sneered. They've never been anything more than mindless, heartless stones and clay idols. She slammed the palm of her hand down on the table. Well now, the true landlord has revealed himself. The God of the Israelites owns the land. He owns the palm trees and the terebinths and the grapevines. He owns the bees that make the honey. He owns the locusts that destroyed Egypt. Everything in his is his, and he can give the land and all that's on it to whoever he chooses. And he has chosen those people across the river in Shittim. They sat in stunned silence. Her father looked up at her. She could see he was trembling. Is this the news we came to hear, daughter? We should gather our families and have a feast together, Joab said dismally. We'll lace the wine with hemlock and be spared the agony of being hacked to pieces by the swords of Israel. Bravely spoken, Mizraim said in disgust. We will live, Rahab said. Mizraim picked up his cup of wine again. How? The Israelites leave no survivors. I helped the spies escape, and they promised to spare our lives when they take the city. And you believe them, Rizriam said? Everyone knows they annihilate every living thing. They swore an oath to me. An oath is no better than the man who swears it. Rahab tipped her chin. I know that better than, than you, my brother. I've had dealings with men since I was a girl and brought, to shame, and, and brought shame upon us for it. Her father slammed his fist on the table. You'll listen to your sister. She is older than you and wiser in the world than all of us. Mizraim winced and lowered his head. They were strangers, father said. Why should you trust them? I asked the men to promise by the Lord, and they did so. Would any man dare swear a vain oath before this God? If they fail to keep their word, they'll answer to him for it. So this is just a little imagination about Rahab and her family. And if you're so inclined, this is a great book on a lot of the women of the Bible. Um, I'll put it in the back so you can see it. Um, It's an imaginary view, but it really opens up through the women, biblical stories. And of course, you go back. She quotes scripture in here, of course, and she does um, tell a story really well. Uh, But anyway, this is available to you. So how are we doing on our columns of fire and clouds? Okay. All right. And if you notice in the fire and clouds, she was promised by God. And she didn't even know who he was. Okay. Okay. Now, I want you to just lay that aside and find the Celtic knot on your table, which is a little plastic um, piece. And I want you to each trace that in your um, journal, if you will. And you'll have to pass it around. There's only one. Um, Also, if you get a chance in the next couple minutes (laughs) to trace it 
on a piece of paper. So what we're going to do is two tracings, one on a piece of paper and one in the journal. Now, the Celtic knot is a continuous knot. So if you, if you uh, like all knots, um, it has, of course, a beginning, but the knot itself continues. So it, it is the flow of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And in the middle, in the middle, and it's not written on my slide here, in the middle, write God. So the flow kind of goes around, and God's in the middle. And he is with you at all times. And I think Michelle did a wonderful explanation of all the aspects of each of the persons of the Trinity. Um, this is a kind of a different view. It doesn't go into the is and the is nots, but it does focus on the flow of the Holy Spirit, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and how he promises us. Again, this is something that um, you'll need to trace individually. If you have done your tracings, then I would like you to try to connect them all with stained glass window sort of lines out towards the edge. Now, a stained glass window is put together with lead, so all the things have to connect to the outside frame. So what you're doing is making pieces that go to the outside edge and creating a stained glass window around your Celtic knot. On this one, the way I have framed grace, on the top it says tracing grace, and then at the bottom here it says Isaiah 61. And on the side it is good news, encouragement, comfort, provision, liberation, vindication, released, renewed, restored, and rebuilt the body of, of um, the uh, verse, verses in Isaiah 61. So this is how I have framed grace for this particular lesson, along with your um, column and your fire. And there are ways of doing this in your imagination that are outrageous. There's 27 people here today and 27 different ways that you will do this project. Um, each one of the uh, markers of imagination that God has in you. That's, whoops, God's marker in us is imagination. I can. Stained glass windows and illuminations were something that were done for centuries before we arrived, even at the written word, which we rely on a great deal now. But the stained glass window was a way of teaching. Um, it was a marker of imagination. Um, somewhere, somewhere along the line, and I think the island of Murano in Italy, they ground the materials and they made these uh, wonderful stained glass windows. And of course, we have one in, in our sanctuary, which is a teaching tool. So as you're working, I'm going to put this out here. I don't think you'll finish everything today. That's okay. You can work in layers. Um, let's see, the last thing. Um, oh, a little bit more about Rahab. She, of course, was rescued by the Israelite spies, and they promised to save her and her family. She had to put a red cord out her window so that the Israelite army would, would know who she was. And this is imagination on my part. They did not bring a red cord with them. They didn't put it in their backpack and travel across and spy with a red cord in their backpack. Where do you think they got it? They took a sword. They cut it off of her decor in her house. Maybe a bunch of things fell down. And she, they said, here, take this red cord and hang it out the window. That's what I think. That's my imagination. Um, and then she hid them on the roof. Um, she, she and her family were saved, and she became the wife of Solomon. Salmon, I guess. And she had Boaz. So that made her Ruth's other mother-in-law. I didn't think about it until I read that again. <laughs> um, so I will put 
uh, some of the clay pieces on the back that Kimberly um, has made. First time working with clay, working with impressions, plastic impressions. Oh, and I do have to tell you, as a backtrack to abundance, I took Kimberly down the bead aisle at Michael's. And it is filled with every possible shape you could touch. She can't see the color or anything else. But I, I never looked, I will never look at that aisle in the same way again. So I, I wanted to thank Kimberly. I don't know if she's here today. Okay. But she's so intuitive and did such a brilliant job. Um, you see her? Oh, she doesn't have her camera on. Anyway, hi, Kimberly. I don't know if you can shout out. But um, she did a great job, and she's continuing to work with clay. She works with a lot of different things. So her imagination is so fertile, and so is yours. So is yours. So thank you for all your hard work. I hope you got a chance to trace things on there. I'll put the books in the back. And, oh, 10.50, that's when I'm supposed to end. That's my time. I'm good. Who knew? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Um, so now we're moving into our discussion questions. And I think Lane's going to, yep, they're up on the screen. Um, and the leaders have the discussion questions as well. And um, they are also on your, I mean, they're in your uh, packet that you should have. So we'll have about 30 minutes, and then we will dismiss from our tables. All right. And I know the ladies in the yellow table here, the second table back, um, they'll be joining uh, one of your groups. Um, so welcome them. And uh, just a gentle reminder for the discussion leaders, let's make sure everybody gets a chance to talk and be heard. Thank you, ladies. Second, but also before you start your discussion, I want to remind us all, next week, the building is hosting a conference. So next week, if, if you pull up the Zoom gallery again, that's what we'll all be doing. We will all be Zooming next week, okay? So I just want to remind you, and I'll do that by email as well. All right, have a great discussion.